The Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 10. Father, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke chapter 10, verse 1, after these things, and that would be the things in the previous chapter. The Lord appointed other 70 also, and the other refers other than the 12. Um, so he appointed 70 assistants here and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place where he himself would come. So they were sent as forerunners uh, to prepare the way for our Lord's visit, to get things organized. <clears throat> Verse 2, Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. So pray to God that he would raise up preachers and teachers of the word of God who will proclaim Jesus and that he would raise up Christians who have a heart for Jesus and will share the message of salvation because the stakes are too high. Eternity is too long and hell is too hot to not share the gospel with people who need it. Three, go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. In other words, it's not going to be easy. Don't expect a pat on the back from the people of the world. Verse 4, Jesus says, Carry neither purse, nor scrip, nor shoes. In other words, trust God to provide. And salute no man by the way. In other words, don't be deterred from the mission that I'm sending you to perform. Don't let anything distract you. <clears throat> five and into whatsoever house you enter first say peace be to this house and uh, you bless that house and you give them the word of God and see what happens six and if the son of peace be there refers to someone who wants the blessings of God through Jesus Christ then it says, your peace shall rest upon it. <clears throat> then bless them. If not, it shall return to you again. So if they don't want Jesus, then whatever you do, don't bless that house. Because then you are blessing rebellion against God. Seven, and in the same house remain, eating and drinking such things as they give. For the laborer is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house. In other words, be content <clears throat> with what they feed you in that house. Don't compare meals from one house to another because you're going to look like you're, a, you're in it for personal gain, and you don't want to do that if you're a preacher that misrepresents Jesus. <clears throat> you know, God's people are asked to sacrifice. You know, other people could do that, and, and I guess it would be perfectly fine, although, you know, a little unseemly. But <clears throat> there would be no divine prohibition from that with other people, but with preachers, ministers, servants of Jesus Christ, it's wrong. It's wrong. You don't, go, you don't take the message of Jesus to the highest bidder. <clears throat> Seven. <clears throat> Actually, verse eight. And into whatsoever city you enter, and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you. So... Don't complain. Just take what they give you and be grateful for it. Remember, this is the providence of God. <clears throat> Nine, and heal the sick who are therein. And say unto them, the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. So they weren't to do miracles for the sake of miracles, but they were to do the miracles as a way of proclaiming that Jesus was the Messiah and it was time to repent. He has arrived. <clears throat> 10. But into whatsoever city you enter, and they receive you not, go your ways out into the streets of the city, or the same, and say, Even the very dust of your city, which cleaves on us, we do wipe off against you. Notwithstanding, be ye sure of this, that the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. You blew it. You had your chance. And we're shaking the dust off of our feet as a way of saying, 
I'm not, as, a, as a way of saying, we, the servants of Jesus Christ, are not responsible for your damnation. You made the, your choice of your own free will. We did our part. We gave you the truth. You rejected it. Your blood is on your own head. <clears throat> That's what that shaking of the feet was symbolic of. And everybody knew it, too. <clears throat> Twelve. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. The judgment on the people who saw a miracle by Jesus or the 12 or the 70, the judgment for their rejection <clears throat> of that truth will be more severe than the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah. And you know what happened to them. Why more severe? Because they had more light. They were sinning against more light, against more truth than Sodom and Gomorrah had. <clears throat> 13, woe unto you, Chorazon, woe unto you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works had been done in Tyre and Sidon, which had been done in you, they would, they had a great while ago repented, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. ashes. So these two cities were, were places where Jesus performed many miracles. Just tremendous things, things never seen before by man. And yet they rejected Christ. So they sinned against a lot of light, and they're going to be in big trouble. 14. But it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. Why? Because Jesus knew that if those miracles would have been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented instead of being judged. 14. <clears throat> Actually, 15. 15. And you, Capernaum, which are exalted to heaven. Yeah, truly exalted to heaven because Capernaum was the headquarters of our Lord Jesus Christ during his three-year ministry. He says, you, sh you shall be thrust down to hell. Just severe punishment. Why? Because they rejected Jesus in spite of all the light that he gave them. 16, he who hears you hears me. He who despises you despises me, and he who despises me despises him who sent me. So notice the chain of command. It goes from God the Father to God the Son to Christians. So when you proclaim the Word of God or when I'm proclaiming the Word of God, I don't worry about, about being rejected. Of course, I pray that people will accept the Word of God, but if they don't, I don't take it personally. Because they're rejecting Jesus, not me, because I'm proclaiming the word of God. It's not my word. It's his word. I'm just the paper boy. I'm <clears throat> just a delivery person. Verse 17. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through your name. They bowed before your name. And they were excited to see that they had power over Jesus, or I should say over demons, in the name of Jesus, because that just was unheard of back in those days. Demons ruled. And they got in someone, you didn't get them out. 18. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. In other words, I saw you casting out demons in my spirit. I saw the kingdom of darkness fall. Every time you cast someone out, I cast a demon out of someone. Satan's kingdom was being chipped away. He's falling from heaven. He's falling from his exalted position. He's losing power. He's losing, he's losing ground. Just like the Nazis in World War II, little by little, the Allies chipped away at their empire until they surrendered. 20. Notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, that, that shouldn't be the most important thing to you. That's fun and everything. It's neat. But rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. The most important thing is that you're saved. That is the most important thing, that you repent and receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and so that when you die, you won't go to hell. Because <clears throat> if you have that, boy, I'll tell you, you've got everything. 
21, in that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank you, Lord, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hid these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, so it seemed good in your sight. He revealed his word to babes. In other words, those who had childlike faith. Those who are not filled with sinful pride. You know, a child is not filled with sinful pride. They're humble. And they believe what you tell you. Or what you tell them. So, those are the kind of people who receive the word of God and are saved as well. Verse 22. All things are delivered to me of my Father. And no man knows who the Son is but the Father. And who the Father is but the Son. So no one can, and it goes on to say, and to whom the Son will reveal him. You don't know the Father unless you know the Son. You can't know God the Father unless you know God the Son. Because God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, through his words and his actions and just how he is, reveals the Father. He's the exact image of God. 23. And he turned him unto his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things that you see. You guys are really fortunate to be living in this time. What a window of opportunity. You know, in all the history of man, thousands of years, you had this one little 33-year period, and then within that, a little bit more than three years of ministry where Jesus really revealed himself as the Son of God. And they were a part of that. Just a minute speck on the history of man. And they, they got to be a part of it. <clears throat> and we're blessed because we can read about it. And we have it in the written word of God. 24. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which you see and have not seen them. And to hear those things which you hear and have not heard them. Uh, people look forward to the coming of the Messiah for centuries. And, and just long to be a part of that time period. And these apostles and these disciples were privileged to be a part of it. <clears throat> a lot to be thankful for. God reminds us that we should be thankful for the things that we have. <clears throat> and, we, and we do need to appreciate whatever good God gives us. <clears throat> Verse 25, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him means that he's going to test Jesus' knowledge of the law, of the Word of God. You know, that would be laughable if it wasn't so hideously sinful. You know, you're going to test Jesus' knowledge of the law. Well, guess who wrote it? Guess whose personality it's based on? Jesus's. But here he goes. <clears throat> Here's his test. Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? What do I have to do to be saved? 26. Jesus said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? In other words, he points him back to the word of God and the law. You want to know what you have to do to inherit eternal life? Well, what does the Bible say? That's our authority. You want to know how to get saved? By doing something, you better look into the Bible, see what it says, because that has the answer. 27, and he answering said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind. In other words, be completely, totally, 100% dedicated to Jesus all the time without fail <clears throat> and love your neighbor as yourself. That means put your neighbor on the same level of devotion to making him happy as, as you are devoted to your own happiness. 28, and he, Jesus, said unto him, You have answered right. You got that right. This do and you will live. So you want to earn eternal life? Then, then that's what you have to do. Keep those two commandments perfectly all the time without failure. And you've got it. <clears throat> 29. But he, willing to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Now he wants to water down the answer. Because he knows that he hasn't done these things perfectly. He knows he hasn't always loved everyone 
the way he loves himself. So he wants to qualify that word labor. He wants to narrow the definition of labor, of neighbor. So perhaps um, he could say that he kept that law. And Jesus answering said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side and want anything to do with him. Too self-absorbed, too self-centered to help him. 32. And likewise a Levite, when he was at that place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. Even this person from the, tr uh, the priestly tribe of Levi, they, they were supposed to be the best, the, the most dedicated to the Lord. He didn't help them either. <clears throat> and remember, this guy is hurting, and he needs help desperately. He needs something. And what did Jesus say the command was? Love your neighbor as yourself. So if you were hurting and you were in that situation, what would you want somebody to do for you? Something. Give you a hand. Take you to a doctor. Take you to someplace where you can rest and recuperate. Well, these, these first two didn't do it. 33. But a certain Samaritan. And remember, the Samaritans and the Jews were enemies. And yet... This Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, where the wounded Israelite was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. Now, the Samaritan and the Jews were natural enemies for religious reasons, and yet he stopped, and he helped this poor Israelite. He helped his enemy. He helped this man that he didn't like. 34, and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an end, and took care of him. Just as if, as if he himself was the one who had been injured. That's how he cared for him. And he was an enemy. I want to keep reiterating that. 35, and on the moral, when he, that is the good Samaritan, departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said to him, take care of him, and whatsoever you spend more, when I come, I will repay you. So he's just being a great guy toward this fellow who needed help. And he didn't know him. And as I said, the Jews and the Samaritans were enemies, which makes this even more remarkable. 36. Which now of these three, the three men who were in contact with this fellow who had been beaten up and left to die, which one of these three do you think was neighbor unto him who fell among the thieves? Who, who acted like his neighbor? 37. He said, he who showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, go and do thou likewise. In other words, everyone is your neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. That means everyone. Those who are good to you, those who are bad to you, those who despise you. If you have an opportunity to help someone, who needs help in any way, then do it. Whatever it may be, do it. You owe God that, as well as that person, but more so you owe God to be that way. So do it. <clears throat> 38. Now, it came to pass, as they went, that he entered into a certain village. And a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. Martha and her sister Mary and brother Lazarus were good friends with Jesus. And he's getting close to, he's getting close to uh, Jerusalem. Actually, they're in Bethany, which was a suburb of Jerusalem. 39. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. You know, just, Mary just loved Jesus so much. He lo she loved the word of God. And she could just sit there and, and absorb it for hours. I hope you feel that way about the Bible. That you just love the Word of God. And, you know, the more you get into the Word of God, the more of a hunger you have for it. It's amazing how that works. And that's how Mary was toward uh, Jesus, because she just loved to sit and listen to him. Because every time he opened up his mouth, he spoke the Word of God. 
So that was Mary, but look at her sister, 40. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. I'm doing all the work. Well, why? If you want to, if you want to work like crazy, do a bunch of extra stuff that doesn't need to be done, then go ahead. If that's how you think God is leading you, then go ahead. But don't complain because somebody else is not like you. Let everyone be themselves in the Lord. You want to serve like that? Then do it. You want to go beyond what is needed? Then do it. But don't don't complain because, because uh, no one else sees things the way you do. So she's complaining. My sister isn't like me. Lord, do something about that. 41, Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha. He's not angry at her. He's kind of pitying her. You are careful and troubled about many things. You know, these things are important, but they're not the most important. You get your priorities just a little bit out of whack, Martha, and, and you want to force those wrong priorities on your sister now. And that's what Jesus is in essence saying in 42. But one thing is needful. One thing is really needful. Mary has chosen that good part. Means she has chosen to just draw closer to me. And that is the most important thing that she could have done and that you and I can do. Just draw closer to Jesus. Draw close to Jesus. You do that, everything else will fall into place. And so Jesus says, that's not going to be taken away from her. The greatest thing that we can do is have communion with Christ. And you think Jesus is going to take that away from you? No way. That's what he wants from us.